Hello developers! My name is Matt Rabel. Today I'd like to show you how to create a Spring Boot and React CRUD app using Spring Boot 3 and the latest version of React which is 18. So let's giddy up! This screencast is based on a blog post that we published back in June of 2022 and you can see here it's use React and Spring Boot to create a simple CRUD app. I did update it recently so it's using the latest Spring Boot 3 and if you click on the code repo here it will have a demo script at demo.adoc adoc for ASCII doc and if I click on the raw version I can see a nicely formatted screen that kind of has the instructions to create everything so the blog post has all the details if you want to read through that it's got the same code in it all I did with this demo script is condensed it so it would be easier to create this screencast so we're going to use OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect to secure things after we get it all working. And then I'll show you how to package it all in the same artifact so you could ship it to production. And you can also still use the productive workflow that you're used to with React where you just do npm start and everything's running. You can change code and, you know, it refreshes automatically. So you can see on the uh, prerequisites there, we have Java 17, Node 16, and the Okta CLI. You'll also need the Auth0 CLI if you want to use the Auth0 portion. So I will go through the Auth0 portion and then I'll show you how to do the Octo portion as well. So the brackets at the end of some of the steps indicate the IntelliJ Live templates that I will use. So you can find the template definitions at MRABEL IDEA Live Templates. You can see I just updated those recently. And we'll start with creating an API app with Spring Boot. So we'll navigate to start.spring.io and put that on the right there. And they recently changed the default to Gradle. So when I originally wrote the tutorial, I used Maven. So select Maven, Java, Spring Boot 3.0.0 there, and then com.octa.developer. And then the artifact is Jug Tours. And the dependencies are JPA and H2 and Web and Lombok. Okay, so we have all those and now we can click generate and then open that up, expand it, and then we'll open up a terminal window and open it up in IntelliJ. Put IntelliJ on the right there and we'll start with creating a JPA domain model. So we're going to create a model directory right here or a model package right but we can uh, we can actually do it as a java class and do model and call it group and then i have those intellij shortcuts i talked about live templates so here's the uh, group class it's got an id a name an address a city state or province and country and you might be wondering well what are we developing so I'm developing a Jug Tours application. Jug stands for Java User Group. And I like to do these Java User Group tours where I go to somewhere like Ireland and I hit a few cities and speak at each city. And it's just a lot of fun to get to know the Java community. In the US, I plan on doing a couple this year, but it might just be, you know, fly out and back because doing a tour in the US, well, they're far away from each other. And it's not like Ireland where you can take a train between cities very easily, unless you maybe go to the East Coast. So we have a group just to designate our Java user group. And then an event would be, you know, Matt is speaking on Wednesday or whatnot. So I'll go ahead and create a new event class. And then again, SBR event is the shortcut I have for that. And so you can see it's got a date, title, description, and then attendees. And then we can create a user for those attendees. And so now if we go back to group, Everything looks good. Everything's compiling. And now we can create a group repository. And we'll create some default data by creating an initializer class. Hardest part is spelling it. And what this does, get a clear picture of it is it implements command line runner, uses that group repository, and it just goes ahead and creates some sample data and inserts it into the database. So 
when I first wrote this presentation, I was planning on speaking at the Seattle Jug, the Denver Jug, the Dublin Jug, and the London Jug, and I'm happy to say that I've spoken at all of those since I wrote the post, except the Denver Jug, but I will be speaking there in February, so, you know, kind of hit them all. And then we'll start the app, and you could start it right here with, uh, you know, IntelliJ, and we should see that data loading up. And you'll notice that it does warn us that we need annotation processing for Lombok. So we'll go ahead and enable that. You will need the Lombok plugin. If you don't have the Lombok plugin installed, it will actually probably fail to compile, you know, these classes. So you can see it printed out everything. So it's proving that that initializer is working. And so we can stop that. We don't need it anymore. And then if we uh, create a group controller class in the web package, This will allow us to CRUD groups. Let's take a closer look at it. Uh, first of all, there's a Jakarta is part of Spring Boot 3. It used to be Javax, right, for Java EE, I think, 8. Uh, but 9 switched to Jakarta, Jakarta EE now. So we do need to add a dependency in order to get things to compile. If you go down to, like, right here and... IntelliJ has some nice code completion, so we can do Spring Boot Starter Validation, and then it'll complete that for us. And now if we go back to our class, you'll see now it's trying to compile. Well, usually there's a, uh, there's a Maven thing here that says, hey, refresh Maven. So let's go back and see if it's there. Nope. Now you got to go over here and be like, hey, reload it. Now if we go back to our class, everything compiles so it's just a uh, group repository or a group controller here takes in that group repository does a find all for the groups you know to get a group it does find by id and all of those methods are created for us by that jpa repository that the group repository extends from and then to create a group pretty simple and then update one similarly and deleting it so all pretty boilerplate so far and then we can restart our app and hit that groups endpoint so I'll go ahead and just use Maven this time, show you that that's possible too. And then I can use HTTP IE, which has an HTTP command to do HTTP 8080 API groups. And you can see all those groups are returned. So that's working well. And now we could post a new group using a command like this. I'd love to go to the Salt Lake City Java user group because well, it's winter time and they have excellent skiing there. And then you could, you know, make sure and that that worked with API group five. Yep. And then you could, uh, you know, update it to say I'm on the slopes. That's the address. So that's there now. And then, of course, you could delete it. And now it deleted it. You know, our API is all working as far as just, you know, crudding groups in a sense. Uh, so now we can create a React app to be the front end for this. So I'm going to use create React app for that. MPX, create React app. And you don't need the app 5, but here's the thing. There's going to be a new version of create React app at some point, And it might not work with this screencast. But if you use this version, I can pretty much guarantee that it will. So please use the version because then everything will work. And I did want to point out in this demo script, just to scroll up a bit, that, you know, I have all these shortcuts with IntelliJ Live Templates, but if you expand this, it has the actual code in here. So if you want to do the tutorial yourself, you should be able to use this demo script and not actually, you know, use my shortcuts. So it's a, it's a nice way to just, you know, see things working. Of course, you can also clone the repo and just follow instructions in the readme to get everything working as well. So... Just expand the project there so we can kind of see what's created. Created an app directory here. It's got our default source from create React app in there. And if we were to look at package.json, you can see it's using React 18.2. So we can CD into that app and we can install Bootstrap 5, React Cookie 4, React Router 6, and React Strap. These are all the latest versions, but like I said, I put the versions on there because in the future, there's a chance that they wouldn't work with uh, with the new version of React or whatnot. And then in index.js, you'll want to add a path to that bootstrap. So import bootstrap. 
And then we can call our Spring Boot API and display the results. So we'll modify app.js to do that. And what this does is it has groups and set groups. It sets the state for those. And then it uses this effect here to set loading to true, fetches those groups, and then sets those groups as appropriate. And you know if it's loading, it says loading, and then just lists them out. So now make sure the Spring Boot app is running. It is. So we can do npm start. Ah, there's one thing I forgot to do. I forgot to proxy from uh, any requests that aren't going to the React app to the back end. So we can add a proxy thing right here. So those requests to API groups will actually go to localhost 8080 now. And I might need to restart for that since it's package.json. Now it's all working. So that was in my instructions here. I just, you know, got a little greedy, a little eager. So make sure, you know, that's all running and you should see that default list of groups. And so now React is all about components and we don't really want to render everything in our, you know, main app.js. So let's create a group list and then populate it with similar code that we already have in this, you know, main app.js here. So we'll call it group list. And you can see it's very similar. It's got the group and set groups and the loading calls that API groups. And then it also has a new method for deleting groups. And, uh, you know, it basically formats everything nicely. So it looks good. And then adds a couple of buttons to edit or delete them. And then it puts it all on the table. We'll also need a nav bar to make things look better. So this is app nav bar .js. And this has a link to the home and it's got this is open set is open. That's a, you know, using an effect to determine the state of the toggling the nav bar and, uh, you know, showing these things. And so most times, and in this demo, you might not even see that toggle because it's basically meant to be responsive. So if we squish the screen down, you don't want to show things on top overlapping each other on a small screen. So it turns into a toggle. So hopefully I'll remember to show that to you and then we'll create a home as well. And so this just links to managing your jug tour. And then we'll change the app.js to use React Router to navigate between components. So you see it defaults to the home element. And then if you click on groups, it'll go to that group list that we could just create it. And then to make the UI a bit more spacious, add a top margin to Bootstrap's container class here. And now everything should be updated right here. So you can see we do have that toggle, right? But if we made this screen bigger, then it would show those items in there. So then we can manage our jug tour. We could see, well, edit doesn't work because we haven't created that group edit component yet, but this is all working and uh, looks good. And so now we'll add a React group edit component. And this has an initial form state of, you know, blank items. So basically if you went to create something new, it would default to nothing in there. And if you wanted to, you know, set the defaults for some reason you could, and then for group and set group, it uses that uh, effect there. And then navigation, it uses the navigate and grabs the ID if it is in the parameters. And then if the ID is in there, it, you know, doesn't fetch anything or it does fetch it and if it isn't in there and it's you know defaults to new then it goes ahead and, and doesn't grab it and then if any changes happen when you click submit it sets that group and then handles the submit and uh you know fetches basically going to that endpoint that we set up for uh put versus post and if the id is already there it does a put because it's just updating it and if it's not it does a post because we want to create a new one and then it sets the headers and sets the body to what we have as the group. And then down here we have that app nav bar. And of course the title changes on whether we're editing or creating a new one. And then we have the form groups for the various you know, input elements. And then there's some uh, CSS here for you know, specifying the rows and some things I did to make you know, the elements look good on the screen. And then the submit button will save it and you can also cancel. So now if we go back, we should be able to edit these groups. 
Oh, not yet. Maybe I need to restart it. Oh, we didn't add it in the beginning. Man, read your instructions, Matt. So we need to add a new mapping for it to React Router. And we don't have exact true here, but you know, good enough. And then uh, edit, import it. And now it should work. So you can see we can add that or modify that Seattle jug. And that's in Seattle, obviously. And if we save that, then it shows up there. We could also add a new one, for instance, Garden State Jug, which I hope to speak at in 2023. And now it's there. So that's all working. And now we can add authentication with Auth0. And this is just using all with an OpenID Connect. So even though I'm saying like Auth0, it should work with any identity provider. So first thing you need to do is modify the palm.xml to have the Spring Security dependencies. The one thing I did want to mention is that you might normally be like, you know, I want to actually have my React app, you know, do the authentication and send the access token to the backend. Well, there's not really a great reason for that. Actually, doing the authentication on the backend is more secure. So that's why I recommend this way. And, you know, if you want to use a CDN to pull in the front end artifacts, you certainly could. Um, if you want to host them on a different server, then that's when you would need to do that pattern where you do the authentication on the front end and you communicate, you know, to the back end. But that's only necessary if you have like different domains for the apps. But the, what I'm showing you here today is the most secure way of implementing OAuth with Spring Boot and React. And so there's no authentication happening on the front end because if the front end stores an access token, well, it's storing it in like local storage or a service worker or whatever. And it's better to store that access token on the back end. Do the authentication on the back end, store it all, and just let Spring Security handle it for you. It's just easier and, you know, frankly, more secure. So you can add the Spring Security dependencies in the palm.xml. So first thing, I'm just going to format it from tabs to spaces because, yeah, I'm that guy. So SBR Spring. OAuth is my shortcut here. And you'll see we're adding Spring Boot Starter Security, Security Config, OAuth to Client, and OAuth to Jose. So those are all the dependencies that you need to do OIDC login with Spring Security. And then the Okta Spring Boot Starter does exist. And what I found is that there are some hard-coded endpoints. So if I try to use it with Auth0, it actually went to the Okta endpoint. So that is something that I hope to get fixed in the next, you know, few months. And uh, then it'd be sweet because you wouldn't have to add all these, you know, spring security dependencies. You just have to have one. And anytime you can memorize any code, I just love it, right? It's easier to memorize four lines of code than whatever this is, 16 lines of code. So now um, what I recommend is installing the Okta Auth0 CLI. So I already have that installed. And if you don't have it, you can get it from I'll GitHub here, Auth0, Auth0 CLI. Make that a bit bigger so you can see it. And it's just a nice tool to actually not have to do stuff in the browser. You can do things much quicker. So that's why I recommend it. So you can run Auth0 apps create. And what I recommend is setting an alias for it. So because it's just hard to remember to type Auth0, it's more characters. So I just do A and then A apps create. And so we're going to do Spring Boot plus React. And no need for a description here. And it's going to be a regular web application. And then the callback URL is going to be standard Spring Security callback URL. So localhost 8080, this is for its, you know, OIDC login. Login, they call it OAuth2, but it's really OIDC code Auth0. And then for the logout URLs, we're going to need two. We're going to need the localhost 3000 for and we're running it as, you know, the uh, React app. And then we're also going to need... 8080 for when we're packaging it with Spring Boot. So we'll need both of those. And then you'll see it prints out all our details. So we have our Auth0 domain right here, and we have our client ID right here. And so now you can modify application.properties to contain those values. And so the first one is that domain, which I'll grab from right here right there and then the client ID and then the client secret which they don't show by default but you can use uh, Auth0 apps open to grab it from your browser so it'll prompt you for which app you want to open 
and then I logged in with GitHub when I first did it. And you can see, here's my application. I just need to copy that client secret. All right, and you see I'm storing my secret in source control. So generally this isn't a great idea. Um, you could use like a .env file instead and then source it before you start it. I'm just doing this for convenience. So never check your secrets into source control. So back to our instructions. We have everything in there. Um, you can also use the Auth0 dashboard, right? That's this right here. So if we were to go back to applications, and create a new application, right? You can, uh, you know, name it what you want and then make sure and select regular web application. Just use the same callback URLs and everything will work. And so let's, uh, let's verify it works, right? Start it up. Well, it's not gonna work quite yet. Oh, it might. Do it back here. It just might not display anything, so. Obviously, I'm going off script because this isn't in my instructions, but localhost 8080 here. And it prompts me to log in. You could continue with Google. Um, I'd have to, well, let's try my Okta account there. And then the reason this doesn't work, it actually authenticated me successfully, but there's no mapping in Spring Boot for the default, you know, slash. So that's why it gives me a standard 404. So if you're used to Spring Boot, you're used to that message. And I also wanted to point out that you can do everything, you know, with Okta as well. And you might be asking, Rabel, like, you've been talking about Okta for a while, and why are you talking about Auth0 now? Well, that's because we bought Auth0, like, what, a year and a half ago? And we just discovered, or we recently reframed things, so we're leading with Auth0. So if you're doing employee apps or apps for your company. We recommend using Okta because it's good for companies to allow their employees to log into all their apps. And if you have partners that you know want to do apps, then we recommend use Okta's customer identity or Okta Siam. But we've realized that the Auth0 customer identity solution is better for developers. And I think you've probably known this for years. And you know I've known it only recently and it's a real pleasure to work with. So as a company, we're leading with Auth0 when you need to embed authentication in your apps or, you know, obviously redirect is the best way to do it, or if you need to secure your API. So those apps can still be added to Okta in the Okta integration network. Um, but, you know, going forward, you should use Auth0 if you're doing customer identity. It's just easier and you don't have to talk to any salespeople. So as a developer, that's always an awesome feature. So to do uh, the same authentication that I set up with Auth0 with Okta, you can add the Okta Spring Boot Starter, and then you install the Okta CLI. You're on Okta Apps Create. Use the default URL because you choose the Okta Spring Boot Starter. will default to you know the same uh, type of URL that we used for Auth0. It just has Okta on the end, and then configure the default you know logout redirect URIs. And then we're going to make some changes uh, in the next section. And so to modify those to work with Okta, you just have to modify the user controller that we'll create to use Okta and then the logout method. Uh, you'll need to modify that a bit to work with Okta as well. And then the home.js that does the logout, the parameters to do logging out of the identity provider is just a little bit different between Okta and Auth0. And personally, like there is a moment in time in the future where you don't have to make these changes, right? Because what you see here is we're grabbing an end session endpoint from the metadata that uh, OpenID Connect provides on Okta. And Auth0 should have that same end session endpoint, they just don't. So when I first started working with it, I was like, why, why don't you have this endpoint? And, uh, and they're working on it, they, they plan to add it, so hopefully that'll be there soon. And you can see all the differences between Okta and Auth0 by clicking this URL and looking at you know, the diff here. So you can see you know, those are a bit different. Dependencies are a bit different, and then down here, you know, there's a bit different in the, the logout URL and in the application properties. So that's about it. And now we need to configure Spring Security. So to make Spring Security React friendly, we need to create a Spring configuration file or a security configuration file. So we'll do that in uh, a new config package. Config, security configuration.
And there's a number of things going on here. Uh, first of all, you'll see, hey, it's like, why didn't you, you know, import everything? And there's this little Maven thing here. Click to load the Maven changes, and then everything could comp should compile. And uh, first of all, in Spring Security 5, there was authorized HTTP requests. If I change to use that, it should show me it's deprecated. Maybe, maybe not. Well, it is. So the reason I'm using authorized HTTP requests is because it's deny by default. So authorize requests is allowed by default. So if you have any URLs in there, it'll protect them if you say to, but if you say, if you don't specify them, it'll allow them by default. And so with authorize HTTP requests, it's more secure and it's saying, you know, deny by default. So I had to add not only slash, but index.html because Spring Security also does more uh, filtering so it's not just on the first request, but forward requests, it'll filter for those as well. And then static uh, is another one. That's where our CSS and JavaScript go. And then these are actually files that'll be served up by the React app. So I had to add those. And then we wanna allow API user because that's how we're gonna use and see if the user is actually logged in. And then for CSRF, uh, we're gonna have a cookie CRF token repository and we set HTTP only false. And so this means that the cookie uh, is, can be read by JavaScript. So that's why we're setting it to false. And then this stack overflow kind of explains that, you know, this guy was like, hey, CSR protection not working with uh, Spring Security 6. And he went through all the stuff, he figured out the solution. And then there's this uh, explanation that goes into the Spring Security documentation. And it basically, you know, there's a new uh, what is it, XOR CSF token request attribute handler that is more secure, but it's used if you display or hide the CSRF token in an HTML page. So it adds a bit more randomness to that. And we just don't need that because we're never displaying this on an HTML page where we're gonna read the CSRF token from the header or from a cookie, and then we're gonna send it back in a header. So um, it's fine to use the default from Spring Security 5, at CRSF token request attribute handler. And then there is something that we do have to do, which is uh, add the actual CSRF token to a header so it can be put in that cookie. So we're gonna create it right here. And so this is recommended by the Spring Security folks. And I've got, you know, you can read that link for it. This basically just takes that CSRF token from the request, puts it in the header, and then it sets it as a cookie because of that. And then so we're adding the filter to do that. And then there's also a request cache. And how this works is it's overriding the default request cache. So when you come from localhost 3000, you're using React to develop everything, uh, it'll go back to 3000. If we didn't have this here, it would actually go back to localhost 8080. And then I added this check as well, because if you're at localhost 8080 slash groups and you stop the server and restart it and then refresh the page, it doesn't send a referrer because it only sends a referrer when you click on a link. And so in that case, I found that if you grab the request URL, you can get that same sort of behavior. So yeah, it is misspelled in real life. That's always fun. And so we created that cookie CSRF filter and now we'll create that user controller. And so what this does is it has a few methods in it. It uh, you know grabs that auth zero registration there and that's so it can get the issuer and uh, it gets the user from here and you'll see if the user is null, if there's no authentication principle present, it'll just return zero. And that's because we wanna indicate to the front end that you know no one's authenticated. And then to log out, it just grabs that issuer URI from the registration and appends the uh, log out that it needs for auth zero and then it has that client ID and returns all that data. And of course it invalidates the session as well. And so you'll also wanna add some user information when you're creating the groups because you wanna have this so everyone create, can create their own jug tour, right? It's not just me, it's Josh Long or James Ward or someone like that wants to do a jug tour and you wanna build this site so everyone can create their own jug tour. So we'll go ahead and create a user repository. 
and it extends from JPA repository and it's a user string make sure that matches yep so it's like why isn't it compiling well it needs to be an interface and it doesn't really need to be public and then we can add a find all by user ID to the group repository and then we'll inject the user repository into the group controller and use it to grab or create an existing user you know and adding a new group so we'll go into the user what is it the group controller here yep and we'll add the user repository now maybe it does need to be public well, let's see I guess it yep dot label field for it and then we can modify this groups right because we want to find all by the current user now so we'll add a principal into the arguments and then we'll find all by user ID and principal get name should do it and that'll grab the subject the sub claim from the ID token and then we can create the group and we'll modify this just using this method here. So instead of just posting it with no information, we'll add the user to it. So we need to add this authentication principle as an import and then our user, which we created earlier. And you'll see it grabs the principal's attributes, uses the sub claim as a user ID, checks to see if the user already exists. And then it you know either creates one or just adds the existing user and then saves the group. And then we can modify React to handle CSRF and be identity aware. So we're gonna start by modifying index.html. I don't know if we opened that one yet, so index.js, sorry, not HTML. And we're gonna use the cookies provider so we can grab that CSRF cookie. There we go, thanks IntelliJ. And then uh, add the cookies provider right here. And then we'll modify home to call that API user endpoint because we want to see if the user is logged in. You can see up here at the top, it's got some, you know, setting up the state with authenticated and set authenticated and the user and all that. So it calls that user with the credentials included and comes back, gets the uh, data if there is any. If it's blank, it sets authentication to false. And then for the login, it's just redirecting to the back end. So this is actually not mapped by Spring Security, but API is protected. So because it's protected, it will prompt you to log in or make you log in. And then the log out just does, uh, you know, logging out and uh, that's how it all works so works pretty well and then down here we got the login and logout button so you know those are rendered accordingly whether you're authenticated or not and then we'll update the group list to have similar changes so we need to specify the cookies we can use the use cookies effect for that and the cookie name and import it and then we'll need to modify down here the uh, headers that are sent All right so the first one is for delete xsrf and then you want to specify that credentials are included and everything else is the same and then for the group edit, you have to do the same thing. So obviously that's a mistake. I will grab this right here. Port that, oh, I already did it for me. And then down for the uh, headers, let's grab that from here. And 
and include those credentials. Make sure that's right, looks right. And then we should be able to restart and uh, use them both. So uh, let's see, make sure that Spring Boot's not running. I'll just start it up here. Now I'll start this one as well. So you do have to start at the root. We'll fix that groups thing in a minute, but now if we log in here, you'll see we're already logged in because we didn't log out of Osteo, right? And if we manage our jug tour, we can say, hey, the Denver jug's having a holiday party. I want to go to that. So let's make sure and put that on our list and it's all working, right? And if you could say, well, the Boulder jug is cool too. You can edit it and uh, yeah, that's all working. So we have successfully integrated authentication into this app and made it so, you know, our users can see only their information. And so the last thing I want to show you is configuring Maven to build and package React with Spring Boot. And so you can use the front end Maven plugin for this. And uh, you'll need to add basically a profile section to your palm.xml and uh, some properties. So you can see what this all looks like here. We're going to basically, you know, let's make that a bit bigger, make it easier to read. We're going to specify just the uh, versions of the things we're going to use. Node 16, NPM 8 and the front end Maven plugin, which this has been the same for a good year. And by default, we're just gonna have the dev profile, so that doesn't expect or build like the React app. But for production, we're gonna use this Maven resources plugin that's gonna filter through our classes and make sure and specify that, hey, the active profile is prod. And that makes it so, you know, Spring Boot is aware that, hey, we're running in this state where we have React in our app. And so this, uh, you know, we'll build the front end Maven plugin, we'll build from that app directory. It'll install Node, so you don't even need Node installed on your machine. And it'll install NPM, do that NPM install and all that. And then it sets that, that Spring Profiles active to prod. And so, you know, we'll, we'll modify the palm.xml and then we'll add this to application of properties. And this value will be replaced by the resources plugin up here. So open up palm.xml. And we'll add those properties first up here at the top with our Java version. And then down at the bottom, we'll add the profiles. And then we need to modify the application.properties here to have that Spring Profiles active. And then now we can stop the client and we can run MVN Spring Boot Run P prod to activate that profile. Now you gotta spell it right. Uh oh. Oh, it's already running on port 8080. So I have this F kill command I use to kill things running on certain ports. Now we could look, open up localhost 8080. There we are. Make it a bit bigger. Log in. And look at that. We're on 8080 instead of 3000 and we can manage our jug tour. You might be like, hey, didn't you add Denver jug and Boulder jug? Where'd those go? Well, those got deleted because by default, H2 deletes the data every time you restart. So you could configure it to store its data on disk, but just the default is to you know lose it every time you restart. So you know everything's working here, but if you go to refresh, you might notice that it doesn't work. And that's because you know, if you start from the root, then all the routing happens via React and React Router. But as soon as you like try to hit an endpoint directly, it expects Spring Security to handle that. So you do have to make some modifications so that works. So we're gonna add a spa web filter, which basically, you know, uses or extends a Spring class and then grabs the path and makes sure that, you know, if the user is authenticated and the path doesn't contain a dot in it because you know you don't want to like you know do any redirecting for any of the like .js or .css files and it matches any other path and go ahead and just send it to the index.html and let react handle it so this is a spa web filter that we'll create in our application right under web here like that and then we need to add it to security configuration because we want it to 
invoke at a certain point. So we'll just make that a bit bigger. And it happens after, I'm just going to put it before that cookie one. And it happens after they're authenticated, right? Because we're checking if the user exists. So now if we stop and restart, now it all works as expected. Pretty cool. Um, the other cool thing is, you know, if we were to run npm start, like that still works. So the, the workflow that you're used to using, you know, where you, uh, you know, can add, uh, let's do Phoenix jug. That still all works, right? So you can have the nice React uh, workflow that you're used to, and you can also have you know Spring Boot running on a different port. So that's pretty slick. And I uh, hope you enjoyed this screencast, and it helped you understand how to integrate React and Spring Boot 3 very securely. And so you can find the code on GitHub, right? It's at this uh, this URL here, Octo Spring Boot React CRUD example. Of course, the blog post is here, so you can read through all of that if you want the nitty gritty details of everything. So thanks for watching today. If you wanna find me on the internet, you can do it on Twitter or rabeldesigns.com is my website. You can see it right there. And then my team is at Octodev and we post you know tutorials and videos like this one. And of course you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and get more content like this that'll brighten your day and make it just a better world to live in. Thanks. Mm -hmm.